I'm trying to talk. I think you're on already. Are we on? Good. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming after the party. <laughs> you guys are hearty souls. I'm, I like that. All right. Um, we're going to we're gonna start. We're going to uh, give a little intro, to, intro of who we are, and then Dan's going to give some kind of up, uh, updated or some instructions that you guys, in case you guys hadn't seen it, on how to uh, kind of get your laptop prepped uh, with a vagrant image so you can kind of follow along during the workshop portion. So. Well, I'm just going to do the intro, and then I'm going to give a quick uh, overview, kind of a uh, quick snapshot of what is OpenStack uh, and where it stands today. And then uh, Dan will take you through kind of the, the internals and ex how everything works. So uh, before I get started, though, let me ask, how, how many of you have uh, new to OpenStack? In other words, you haven't, OK. <laughs> how are you classified? Good, OK. Then this is the right workshop for you. <laughs> Great. Let's get started. So uh, let me introduce myself. My name is Ken Hoy. Uh, I'm currently at Rackspace uh, as, a, as the OpenStack evangelist. And uh, I've been involved with uh, OpenStack for about three years. And I'm Dan Radies. I'm uh, on the OpenStack team at Red Hat. Been at Red Hat for about eight years and uh, working on OpenStack for um, three and a half now, I think. I counted seven summits that I've been able to attend and be a part of the community. Um, the, so Ken was talking about the Vagrant file. If you didn't see in the abstract of this session, there's a link out to a, a quick web page that we put together that references a Vagrant file. Uh, so while he's given a little bit of the introduction of OpenStack and how it came to be in some of its history, Pull down that Vagrant file and go ahead and see if you can get it running to um, get that, vir uh, that virtual machine running because the, the Vagrant file that's out there is the same exact one that I'm going to present off of uh, so you can follow along with it. It takes a little while to go uh, to, to finish doing the installation um, so if you don't quite get it done here uh, we'll also have a link to the slides at the, the end of the session as well so you can take the Vagrant file and the slides later and then uh, work through it again. So everything here you'll be able to do now as we're working through it as well, take it with you and, and give it another try, um, you know, on your own time as well. Okay, great. So Dan just gave you permission not to listen to me <laughs> while well, you're busy getting your vagrant box up. That's okay. So, uh, so yeah, go, so go on to the schedule and go on the uh, abstract and somewhere in the bottom, I think there's a link to the vagrant bo uh, box that uh, Dan put together. Okay, while you're doing that, I let's, I'm going to give a very quick kind of history of where OpenStack came from. So this email you're looking at um, is the actual email that was sent by an executive uh, at Rackspace at the time in 2010 to NASA, CT, the CTO of NASA at the time. He's essentially, essentially inviting them to come alongside Rackspace to create a new open source cloud platform. So the, so the history of that is that um, Rackspace uh, up to 2010 had been running their own public cloud, but it, uh, but it was not a it was a proprietary piece of code, and it had scalability challenges. So when they got to a certain point where they, they knew they couldn't scale anymore, they they decided they wanted to rewrite uh, the entire thing, and at that point they made a decision to to use Python as the underlying uh, uh, programming language, and at the at the same time, or roughly the same time that was happening, NASA had an initiative to create a p private cloud. And they decided they wanted to see if they could pick something that was open source, if possible. And they evaluated some of the uh, current the platforms that are out there at that time, like uh, I think uh, CloudStack, Eucalyptus, and, uh, and others, and decided it qu didn't quite fit their needs. So they decided they would build their own uh, public cloud as well, I mean, own private cloud. Um, and they independently of op Rackspace also chose to use Python as their uh, program language. So uh, the executive that, who sent the email you saw in the previous slide uh, read about it, contacted uh, uh, Chris Kemp, who's, who was the CTO of NASA at the time, and basically said, hey, do you want to work together? And so all that is where OpenStack came from. And, uh, and one, of the, one of the decisions they made was even though th they had these two teams working together, they still were limited, somewhat limited in resources, right? NASA is not, uh, 
It's not a software company per se. And while Rackspace had a lot of software developers, it is by nature a managed, was at that time a managed hosting company. So they decided the best way to grow OpenStack quickly was to open source it and give it to the commun uh, community of people who could then uh, write code and kind of build up the project. So this is, I'm not sh uh, this is probably a little outdated, but it kind of shows you in the six years time how quickly the oh, this open source project has grown from really just th those two entities to the point where you have hundreds of companies spanning uh, multiple geographies. And you, also, you can also see that uh, OpenStack is now starting to grow in its adoption. So th this is a list of companies that, um, ha that have, re um, re they may have adopted OpenStack much at the very beginning, but these are the ones who have come out in the last year and publicly said, hey, we are in fact using OpenStack. Um, and you can see it's, uh, it's across multiple, it's not just uh, science research, it's not just public cloud companies, it's now uh, true enterprise adoption. So since you guys are new, I'm going to give a, a very quick definition of what is, or overview of what is OpenStack. So this picture you may have seen from the foundation, uh, OpenStack Foundation website. So basically, if you think about what, uh, what data center infrastructure was like before cloud computing, it's basically a lot of silos of physical hardware, like physical servers, networks, and, uh, and storage. And then somewhere along the way, uh, we started figuring out how to virtualize m much of that and started being able to p uh, create pools of resources. The problem, though, was uh, each of those silos had to be managed and provisioned separately, and it required someone who had a lot of knowledge about how to set up a server, set up a uh, you know, piece of networking gear or storage. So the idea behind cloud computing, which is where OpenStack fits into, is what if we could, uh, what if we could figure out a way to kind of automate all of that management and provisioning of those virtual resources and make it really easy for an end user who d doesn't necessarily know much about storage or about networking to be able to, uh, to provision his, their own resources without having to go through an IT person. Right? The idea to be able to do things very quickly. So if you think, if you look here, that basically there are these southbound APIs that talk to the infrastructure to, uh, to manage it, and that's basically any virtualization platform should be able to do. What makes OpenStack a cloud, a true cloud, cloud computing platform, is actually the northbound APIs, right? The, the fact that, again, a developer through APIs or through a web portal could actually say, hey, I want 10 machines that now network together in this way with this amount of storage and never have to talk to an operator, never have to talk to an, uh, a storage admin and say, hey, I need, I need you know, 10 te two terabytes of storage tomorrow. And the idea, also, if you look at this picture, uh, one of the differences between OpenStack and some other uh, platforms is that it's, it's a very loosely coupled architecture. In other words, uh, all the components within OpenStack, from, uh, from the uh, user experience, the dashboard, to the storage, to the networking, to the servers, the, it isn't one monolithic system that makes system calls to each other. Right? Everything's done through API. So every, every, every component is really its own project. It's kind of own, uh, own program, and we're just relying on these open REST APIs to talk to, talk to each other. And the idea is this way, uh, you can change out different parts, you can, uh, you can scale out different components without necessarily negatively impacting other components. That's and the all idea, these components anyway. that he has on this slide is what we're gonna go through in the yeah. hands-on part. So we're gonna identify all the different pieces and how they interact yeah. with one another. Yeah. So this is just kind of giving you an uh, kind of overview of how the different components tie together. Dan will actually walk through what each of these components do within an OpenStack cloud platform. So at the end of the day, the, um, the goal of OpenStack right, is to set, be able to uh, allow developers to create applications that, uh, that they can build on a platform that they can, uh, they can self-service, right, create, and then rapidly scale. Right, that is fundamentally what OpenStack is designed to do. Let developers move really fast and grow applications to scale. Uh, this is an example of a reference architecture of what 
a, tip, a, a smallish or typical uh, OpenStack implementation might look like. Uh, this is actually based on uh, Red Hat OpenStack platforms reference architecture. Uh, and you see here, again, there's different, uh, the OpenStack kind of spread out across many, uh, many components or many servers in order to deliver this cloud computing platform. We'll talk uh, quickly about some consumption models, different ways that you can actually uh, consume or use OpenStack today. So there are three primary ways. One is uh, public cloud, uh, private cloud, and then what we call the middle ground, which is private cloud as a service. So public cloud, pretty easy to understand. It's what Rackspace has, is what DreamHost has. Uh, it's what Amazon uses, has, even though they, they are not running an OpenStack. So that's shared infrastructure that anyone can get access to. Private cloud distro, again, it's a, it's the, the design is to have a share, a, um, a private infrastructure, cloud platform infrastructure that no one else has access to besides your company. And there's a number of uh, players that do that. Um, and then private cloud as a service, it's kind of a middle, kind of a middle ground where you can do some trade-offs where it's, it's still, it is single tenant, but you don't manage it, right? Because one, uh, one of the value props of a public cloud is you don't have to run this cloud platform as an operator. You just consume it as a developer. Someone else handles it. Um, and the downside is that's out of your control. Someone else has to run it for you. And, a, and you're sharing it with other people. A private cloud, you, get, you have exclusive access. You get to control it. The problem is you have to, you have to operate it on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the private cloud as a service is that middle ground that says, consume it like it's a public cloud, but uh, you're basically handing off management to someone else, like it's a, um, even though it's, again, running inside, maybe running inside your own data center. So a couple of the big players. Uh, this is just a sample. There are many. If you look on the uh, OpenStack.org marketplace webpage, there is many, many more <laughs> uh, vendors that are involved. I'm just kind of laying out some of the big key ones I know of. That, uh, and, and you'll notice in some, you'll see that in some cases, uh, as, you, as you look on that website, that some vendors actually play across uh, two or three of these spaces. So um, this is the slightly marketing piece. <laughs> I, won't, I won't make it very long. So uh, at, uh, as I mentioned, I'm from Rackspace. So Rackspace has a couple of different approaches uh, to, to um, presenting OpenStack. So I talked about the public cloud because that's basically what our, our public cloud is built on today. It's built on OpenStack. From a private cloud perspective, we, we actually don't have a distribution per se. Uh, we have, we offer that private cloud as a service. So everything we do is as, a ser as an Earth service offering that we manage, whether it's our public cloud or is a single tenant private cloud for a customer. And we offer, offer that in two flavors right now. One is a, uh, the private cloud is using, just using the uh, upstream code right, that's running on Ubuntu, or we, we can also do um, private cloud as a service using Red Hat OpenStack. So customers have either option. And then Red Hat, um, up to a few months ago, really uh, had the one option of, here's a distribution that you can download, and uh, Red Hat will, can help you uh, set up and deploy, but primarily you run it yourself, right? So uh, what's new now is because of what we're doing around wrapping our managed services around Red Hat OpenStack, essentially Red Hat now has, has both the distribution uh, offering and also this private cloud as a service offering. So. Okay, that was the marketing piece. All right, let me talk a little bit about um, it's, it's some ways you can learn OpenStack. Obviously, you guys being this workshop is a great, great way to get started. But there are, other, there are other things you can do once you get back to wherever your, you know, your home is for you and be able to continue learning OpenStack. So a couple of things. One is um, there's a bunch of resources you can look at. OpenStack Foundation is probably the best place to start. Uh, it has documentation, it has videos, so you can kind of learn more about what OpenStack is and how to use it. Um, the few books that are out, uh, there's an OpenStack Cloud Computing Cookbook that was written by a couple of Rackspace engineers. Uh, that is, it's a great way to use, I think they also use Vagrant, to be able to spin up a, kind of do what we're doing here, spin up a, a one-node or multi-node environment and be able to play with it. 
Uh, OpenStack Essentials is actually the book that Dan wrote um, that th does a similar thing. So if you like the workshop today, go buy his book. It's, <laughs> it's my it's suggestion. Ken and I have done this workshop, what, four or five times? Five? This is my fifth time, I yeah, think. Yeah, together. So we, we've kind of become partners in crime. Yeah. Uh, this OpenStack Essentials book is essentially a, a print form of the hands-on part of this presentation that I'll do. So uh, a lot of the same exact stuff that I do right here today, uh, this is a, a print form that will walk you through and give you mm -hmm. more in-depth information about the different pieces. Yep. Um, it's actually uh, the first draft of the second edition has just been completed last week. So hopefully in the next week or two here, we'll have the second edition published. Um, so uh, you're welcome to get the first edition. It has lots of great information. There's a few extra updates and additional information that's been added. So if you want to wait a couple weeks for the second edition. Um, okay. That's good to know. Yep. All right. Uh, there's other books that have been out. That, um, for a long time, there, was there were no resources for learning OpenStack other than the website. It was a lot of Googling, or Googling around and finding things that actually didn't work because it was outdated. Um, so uh, since OpenStack's gone more mainstream, there's many more kind of real books that have been written. So uh, I forgot to put this in the deck, um, but uh, it it's, we've, Orax has been fortunate because of our involvement with OpenStack for, since its very beginning. We've had a lot of experience and a lot of people who've worked on it. And a lot of them have gone on the right books. So that right now, there are three or four books that are including the one in the screen that's um, authored by Rackspace uh, employee, uh, empl engineers. And we're actually giving them all away. Um, at, uh, I don't know, how many of you have seen the Rackspace Cantina? It's kind of the restaurant? OK. So this afternoon, I think starting, I want to say starting at 3. Yeah, probably 3. Um, we're going to be giving away three of the books that have been written by uh, Rackspace engineers. So you just have to kind of go to the cantina, get online, they'll hand out the book. You, if you want, they can sign it and you can actually talk to them and ask, question, ask the authors questions. So uh, a couple, uh, several of those people are actually Rack, either, uh, are actually current Rackspace engineers. So one of them being like a, for example, a, a network, probably the best uh, Rack OpenStack networking book that's out there today. It's has written by one of our engineers and he's gonna be uh, signing the book and giving them away to people at the uh, cantina later this afternoon, so. All right, last thing, I think it's the last slide for me. Um, if there's likely a user group in your, kind of where you live or very close, hopefully there is. If there is, they, these groups tend to meet every month or every other month, and they go over, you know, thing, uh, either technologies involved with OpenStack or do, sometimes they do hackathons or just workshops. So, I encourage you to go to the OpenStack.org community website, find a user group near you, and get involved with that community on a regular basis. Uh, the other thing is there are, um, the foundation started doing something called OpenStack Days, which is basically, think of it as like a mini summit um, that's done regionally. So uh, it's, historically, that's been done internationally. Uh, last couple of years, they, they did uh, a, uh, what do they call it, Open, uh, OpenStack in Silicon Valley. Uh, and then later this year, we will we'll have the first OpenStack Day East, which will be in New York City. So again, it's tend to be one or two day uh, events where would, you have a keynote and you have breakouts just like you would at a full-blown <coughs> OpenStack Summit. Okay, so with that, let's get going. I'm gonna uh, let Dan take over from here. Do you need the click? Yeah, one? let me borrow that okay. to start out with. And yeah. I'll stay here just if the, you, you guys have questions along the way. Uh, between Dan and I, we should be able to answer them. Okay, so Red Hat, the way that Red Hat operates as a company is that every product that we have also has a um, associated community project. So everything is open source that we have. Everything that we write goes first into an upstream if possible, and if it doesn't go directly into the upstream, we'll carry the patch internally until we can get it into the upstream. Um, so, as Ken mentioned before, there's uh, Red Hat OpenStack Platform, which is our supported enterprise product. But on the community side, we have RDO. So RDO is our community-supported distribution of OpenStack. And that's what we're going to use here today. That's what, if you've, if you've been able to get your virtual machine up and running with Vagrant, it has gone out to RDO and installed RDO into this virtual machine, and that's what we're going to walk through. RDO, we take the upstream source, and we package it into RPM, and then we give it to you. So what you get in RDO is directly what comes from the upstream. 
if you're installing Red Hat Enterprise, uh, I'm sorry, Red Hat, they just changed the name, so I'm trying to learn how to say it correctly. <laughs> uh, Red Hat OpenStack Platform, if you're using that, it's, it is supported by the company, and so we oftentimes will carry patches for customers, so there's a small delta between what's in the community distribution RDO versus what's in the enterprise distribution uh, OSP, OpenStack Platform. Um, and so, but if you look at the two, really the only difference between the two of them on a, in a big picture is, is just the branding of it, that when you install OSP, it's Red Hat branded, and when you install RDO, there's no branding, it's just vanilla OpenStack. So that gives you a little in, um, idea of, of what we're installing and using today. Um, RDOproject.org, uh, down there at the bottom, is where all kinds of documentation, where you go to get started if you wanted to uh, not use the Vagrant file that I've given you, if you want to do a, a larger installation or learn how to do more than just a little sample <coughs> installation. Uh, lots of documentation and materials there. So this is a, a picture of the components that we're going to go through. I'm going to quickly touch on each one of them, uh, and then we'll get started actually looking at each of them. Um, Keystone is identity, so this is where you're going to be able to do authentication and all of the services are registered there, so everyone has an identity and needs to be authenticated with one another, not just the end users, but all these components together. After we do identity, we'll look at Glance. Glance is image management, so when a VM starts, it has to have a disk behind it, and so what we do is we pre-build the images and load them into Glance so that when the v VM starts, it goes out to Glance and pulls a copy of the image that's been pre-built. And then instead of you having to go through the whole installation process, it's pre-installed and ready to go, and Nova boots it up, customizes the networking and identity inside of it, and then you're ready to run. So it's a way to quickly get those VMs up and running. Once you, before you can get that instance actually running, you need the disk image from Glance, and you also need a network to attach it to. So that next we'll go to Neutron, which is OpenStack networking, and we'll look at creating a virtual network to attach it to. Then once you have that image available and the network available and the identity to get you into uh, OpenStack, then Nova is our compute component, and Nova is going to take all those pieces and put them together, talk to the hypervisor, and actually launch that VM using the image, using the network that has been provided to it. Once the instance is up and running, the instance in, in cloud computing or in OpenStack, the paradigm is elastic computing. Uh, and the idea is that these VMs are intended to be kind of disposable, that if you have multiple VMs that are working together to run an application and one goes down, instead of working really hard to try and keep that one back up and figure out what went wrong with it while end users are waiting for that capacity to come back, instead you just kind of slice it off and spin up a new one because it's so quick and, and inexpensive to do that. And so doing that, the disk underneath it is ephemeral. It doesn't last. It, it gets thrown away with the image if it gets axed. So Cinder is our volume service. We can attach a persistent block device out to those VMs to write information to that block device. That way, if the instance gets axed, you're able to reattach that block volume device to another um, instance so that you can continue using the information that you've been using. This isn't shared storage, it's block storage, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship between the, the drive and the, um, the, the volume and the instance. There is a shared storage called Manila, which we won't get into, so if you need shared storage, you can do that as well. Uh, object storage is very simple storage, so it's, it's simple content objects, so instead of working at the block level as it, and presenting a volume as a, a disk to the VM, Instead, you use an API and you pass content with kind of a, a name value sort of mentality that you can, this is the name of the object that I want to store and this is the content that's going to go in it, or this is the name of the object that I want to pull and, this, and it gives you the content in it. So it's, it's very basic file storage, but it can be very powerful. There's, there's websites that use object storage to run their entire system because of how flexible and how simple it is, uh, as well as, as there's software defined and, and behind it, so you can use commodity servers to do replication and mirroring, and there's a lot of power behind object storage. It's not just simple file transfer back and forth. Yeah, and you've probably, um, if you've been at this, uh, how, how many of you have this, is this your, how many people here, this, for them this is their first summit? Wow, okay, a lot of you, all right. So you might have heard that there's uh, a lot of these, uh, all these other project names that we haven't mentioned. 
like Magnum um, and projects like that. So uh, OpenStack actually is made up of, uh, I think, currently over 50 projects, which can be dizzying. Obviously, we're not showing all 50 projects. <laughs> um, these are what uh, I would consider to be more core projects. In other words, what are the kind of what are the minimum things I need to get have, you know, to say st uh, spin up a OpenStack cloud. So this is kind of, so what Dan and I are going through are the kind of the core stuff, and then all these other 40 some other odd other projects are, are useful projects that are what things that you layer on to your core your base OpenStack cloud. So we just don't have time to touch all of those in the hour and a half they give us this yeah. morning. And they don't all fit in one slide either. <laughs> You'd probably also be bored to tears <laughs> by the end of it. <laughs> Um, okay, and so the last one at the top here is the dashboard. It's based on a project called Horizon, which is more of a framework. So dashboard and Horizon are, are somewhat analogous in the component that you're working with. Um, the, the technical difference is that Horizon is the framework underneath it that the dashboard, the web interface, is built on top of. So that's the first thing we're going to do here is, is connect to the dashboard, the web interface, and that's where we're going to be today, working through these concepts so that you can learn and understand how they work together through this, this graph. We're going to go in and create each of these virtual resources and attach them together to get a virtual machine up and running in OpenStack. Everything in OpenStack is built modular, 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 and, and the dashboard is no different. Uh, so as Ken mentioned, there's almost 50 projects th at this point. And so as each of those projects come through, the dashboard is committed to working hard to get each of them to have web support, we, uh, dashboard support in it. And so it has to be built modularly, that a, a new project comes online or a project that previously hasn't had a web interface comes into the dashboard and says we're ready to have our, our web interface there or we've done this work for it. Um, they've created another module that they can drop in and integrate in and so it, it, it makes it quick in how it, it ends up being able to be more projects can be added to the dashboard. So in that, in our abstract, there was the web link that had a link out to the Vagrant file. Um, if you're able to get that up and running and installed, then this is kind of where we start getting into that. Uh, so Vagrant Up is going to do that installation. If you haven't done it yet, it's going to take a little while for the OpenStack to actually be installed. If you've already done it and then did a Vagrant Halt, uh, like I had put in the instructions, then you should be able to Vagrant Up again, and it'll come right back to where it was before uh, when, when you shut it down previously. Um, the next thing we need to do then is connect to the dashboard and try and log in using it. So Vagrant SSH will log you into the command line of that VM that you've brought up. sudo i will change you to the root user. And we're going to talk a little bit more about installation methods at the end. Uh, the installation method we use is, is called Packstack here, and it's good for kind of one-off, simple, demo-like environments, which is why it's being used here. And when it installs, the Keystone RC admin file is dropped into the root user's home directory. So if you cat that file out and, and list out the contents in it, um, the administrator username and password that get generated for you are put in there. And then finally, we'll, this is the web URL that um, Vagrant has helped us to present. So you should be able, from your web browser, once OpenStack has completed installing, uh, connect to this uh, 192.168.37.2, and the dashboard will get appended. If you just uh, connect to the IP address, it'll redirect out to the dashboard. So let's do a quick check. How many of you here have gotten to the point where you've been able to fake one up? OK. Yeah. How, yeah. How, how many of you are still working on? Getting the vegan, okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay, and so as I mentioned before too, if, if you're having trouble getting it to work um, or it's still running, uh, catch up as you can, but also I'll have the slides for you later and you know take the file with you. So you should be able to use this after the presentation as well. And uh, we'll give you Ken's email so you can send all the <laughs> questions <laughs> to him if it doesn't continue to work. <laughs> yeah. It's in the abstract for the session. There's, there should be a link in there. The, like the schedule, the, the summit schedule. Yeah, go, go find the, the, um, yeah. the, se the session description in the schedule, and the link is down there at the bottom. OK, so connecting to the dashboard. Um, so if you connect to that URL that I've put in there, 
you're going to see a screen that looks like this. And then if you SSH in, Let me get my Vagrant running again. I'm sorry. Make I didn't the font hear bigger. Oh yeah. I'm not doing anything that's important right now. I'm I'm restarting Vagrant. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. There we go. Can you see that? Is that good? Okay. So there you go. You, you see I've, uh, my Vagrant was just suspended, so it was still running, but it was, it was in a, a suspended state, so I resumed it. And then Vagrant SSH, so now I'm on that VM that Vagrant created for us. And then sudo minus i and cat keystone rc. So you'll see here that there's OS username admin, so that's the generic admin username that's generated for us. And then OS password right underneath it is a randomly generated password. And so that's what we need to get into the dashboard. So I'm going to copy that password and log in as admin. And now I'm logged in as the administrator user to the dashboard. So let's keep going from there. So Keystone Identity Management is next. Uh, the idea here is that in the install that we've done, we've made it a centralized identity service and a centralized catalog of services. What this means is that all the users and all of the components within OpenStack can call into Keystone and ask how to connect to the different components. So in particular, when if, if you use the command line and or the command line or the web interface, every time you make a call to create a virtual resource, you have to connect to one of the components that we're looking at today. And so when you connect to that component, you have to be authenticated. And then if that component needs to talk to another component to create virtual resources or associate them in some way, those components have to authenticate to each other. So there's tokens and usernames and passwords that are all passed around from the users and the services. And so the identity services, the users, and the catalog of services is that you can ask Keystone, how do I connect to service Nova or to service Glance? And it will respond to you with a, a connection URL so that you can make your connection to that service. Yeah, so w one, one way to uh, kind of, one illustration that may help in your head is think of as, um, think of all the components that you need to spin up some resources, like the, the spinning up a server, spinning up a, some switchers, spinning up some storage. Think of each of those as having workers to actually do that work for you. Um, and when the ser server worker needs the storage, it needs to sp essentially present a badge that says, hey, this is who I am, and I'm authorized to ask you to present me some storage. Mm -hmm. right, that's essentially what Keystone is. It's a way to, for these workers to present badges, to a authorized badge to each other to say, I need a resource from you so that I can pull it all together to spin up a resource. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and then for your authentication options, these are just a, a couple, but Keystone can also have other uh, identity management or authentication systems plugged into it so the users can be connected to LDAP or AD or username, password token, OAuth. Um, you know, all if you're familiar with Apache Remote User, where Apache also um, supports a bunch of other authentication schemes, you can plug into Apache and rely on that remote user uh, login methodology and, and Keystone will also recognize that. So there's, you're not tied to username, password in the way that we've done in this demonstration here. So now if we create a user, I'm logged in as the administrator user so I can manage users. I'm going to click on the, the users link on the side here. Can you guys see that? A little bigger would be good. Um, and then, well, now my button's been pulled off. And then up at the top here, there's a, a create user, the top right over here, there's a, a create user button. So you click that and it's going to give you a big dialog that you can fill in all the information. So I'm going to put my name in here and I could describe myself, I guess, in the description. So what's happening here is, um, 
Dan's logged in as, when, you, when he says he's an admin, he's basically the global super user for the, for the in OpenStack cloud. And um, he'll, uh, Dan will talk more about it later, but there's a concept of in that cloud, you can have multiple tenants that have resources only available, that you can assign specific resources to that tenant. And then within each tenant, um, you can give, you can create users that only have access to that tenant. So you don't have to give everyone that's using your cloud the super user rights. And just to make things super confusing, OpenStack has mixed the word tenant and project. So if you hear tenant or you hear project, they're the same thing. It's just on the command line, it started with tenant, and then in the dashboard, they started using project. And now they're starting to switch to using project on the command line as well. Uh, so you can see here we're, we're at primary project. The idea in Keystone is that you kind of have a, a, a triangle of things that are important. You have a username. You have a project that the user will live in, and then you have a role that the user is associated with the project. So all of your virtual resources that get created have to be created inside of one of these projects, and a user is no different. A user gets assigned to a project. Uh, in general, if there's a group of people that are all together, then you will uh, name the project something relative to the users, but if it's a, a project specifically for that user, the standard is kind of to just create the project name with the same name as the user. So I'm going to come in here and do uh, create a, a project. And if I had more members to add to it, I could do that on this tab. Um, but I'm just going to create project. Right. So I, I created project with my name that matches my username. And then what the dashboard does for you is brings you back to the same screen that you're at. So all the information I'd already filled out is there. And now my primary project is already filled in there. When I click this plus button here and went to that other dialog, I switched out of the create user and I actually created a new project object. And then after that project was created, I came back into the create user and so now it's associating it. And then at the bottom, the role uh, mem is, is member here. And member is a generic non-administrative role for you to be in your tenant. Yeah, so, uh, so is it in a production environment? This, you would likely set up uh, you know, let's say, you, let's say developers are going to be using this. Um, you may create a tenant for every, uh, for every software project. And then a user could be a member of one or more of those projects, software pro uh, development projects. And in, uh, for in, in each project, he can have, in one place, he could have an admin row, and then another project, that same user could have just a member row. Um, so, depends. so there's a lot of flexibility in what you can do. And then later, we're going to look at using Swift. And Swift has a special role that it needs to be connected to. So I'm going to come in here. You can see the project that I created is down at the bottom uh, that matches my username. And then I'm going to go to Manage Members. And you'll see that my name is in here, and I'm a member role. But I can also add myself as a Swift operator. And so for us to be able to do Swift later, we have to add this um, role to my user within the project. There is some configuration that you're able to automatically make all users in a project Swift operators. Um, it's not configured by default in Packstack what we're using. So I'll save that. And now I'm a member and a Swift operator, so we can later use Swift. So at this point, I have a user, I have a project, and I have a role in my project. So I can log out as the administrative user and then log in as myself my non-privileged user. And the first thing to notice here as a non-privileged user is that there's no administrative panels here. So as you're interacting with this, log back in as the administrator, log back in as yourself, and, and note the difference of here I've got project and compute and network object store, so my basic virtual resources that I'm managing. And then in the administrative, there's also user management and an administrative panel that lets you globally manage all of the resources within the within this cluster. So now that we have a user, let's start kind of working towards getting a virtual machine up and running. The first thing we talked about was um, uh, the image management that Glance houses these pre-built images. The idea again being that we don't want to have to sit and wait for the installation to run for each of these virtual machines when they want launch. That we can it's very boilerplate to do this installation. So if we do the installation ahead of time and put a generic image into Glance, then when we launch that image, all we have to do is do a couple little tweaks to make it unique in its networking information or its, its identity on the, on, um, as a machine. 
and then we can, it, it's very quick to pull that image and boot it and start running from it. So Glance is image management, it's a registry for these disk images, so we import the disk images into Glance and then you're able to recall them and share them across your cloud. There's lots of these images pre-built for you on the internet, so if there's a particular distro or flavor of OS that you want to use, um, you know, go search on the web for a cloud image or OpenStack image uh, for the particular distro that you want. Uh, and, and most all distros now have one of these images pre-built for you that you can download and put it in. So looking at adding an image, um, instead of trying to distribute this image to everybody and uh, get it so you can download it, I went ahead and had it imported for you. So if you go to images in this screen, you can see that there's a Cirrus image. Cirrus is a, an operating system that's built for developmental testing purposes, so it's, it's very insecure as an as a operating system, and it's not recommended at all for use for anything but basic testing and demoing. Um, and the reason it's great for demoing and testing is that it's only 12 megs, so if you see the size over there on the right, it's, it's a teeny tiny little image, and that's because there's not much in it. Um, but for instance, if you wanted to, say, uh, put Fedora or CentOS or something, um, we could say Cloud Fedora, and it comes right up with Download Some Cloud Fedora, Fedora. yeah. Somewhere. <laughs> so here we could, if I download this Fedora image here, um, that, that's an image that we could pull directly into OpenStack. I might have one already downloaded. So in my OpenStack here, we say create image, Fedora. You can actually give it a URL. So um, this image location that's here, if I had just put the direct URL to that image, it would let me pass that in, and then it would download it, and it would import it. I'm going to see if I have a file waiting for me. Yeah, there you go. So I've got a, a Fedora image, cloud image here. So I've selected that, and it's the format has seen that I've got a, a QCAL2 format, so you want that format to match the image that's come down. You can mark it public or not. This public flag here says, can everybody in the OpenStack cloud use it, or can only I use it in my project? So that's, that's a public-private based on the, the tenant or the project that it's being imported in. And then protected is a flag that says it can't be deleted unless that protected flag is taken off. So the user that imported it can take that flag off or an administrator can take it off, but no one can delete it until that flag is, is unchecked. I'm going to do public just for fun. Create image. Now create image is not actually creating the image like the file itself. All it's doing is creating a record of the file that I've previously downloaded. So you download the file from the internet and then create image imports it into the registry. I don't know why it didn't import. Okay, a quick check. Wh where are you guys at? Uh, has anyone got a dashboard up and running? Okay, good. A few of you. Uh, are the rest of you still trying to get the vacant box? Oh, uh, how, is, uh, how many of you are still trying to get the vacant box up and running? Okay. <laughs> One of the challenges <laughs> of a hotel Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay, so for whatever reason, it does want to import Fedora here. There's error messages we could go look at, but we don't have time. We've got Cirrus in there, so hopefully we'll be able to move forward and launch the Cirrus image. <laughs> okay, so that was the process to import an image. If you had a different image you wanted to import, you could do that. You can have multiple images in there. Uh, you can even go to the extent of rolling your own image. So if you wanted to build, say, a CentOS image that had your application pre-built into it so that when you launch an instance, you can maybe launch over and over a, a application inside of that image that you want to cluster together or you're doing, maybe all your developers need a, a base image to do their development on. You can custom roll these images and then add them to it and then your developers could come in and say, yeah, launch me another development environment, launch me a, a different development environment. And so managing these images can become very powerful for productivity in how you roll them and how you manage them. Uh, 
Again, there's not time to be able to do that, but there's lots of information online about how to create them. So if you Google, uh, you know, create OpenStack cloud image or something like that, then um, there's more information there. Yeah, there's a line you can add. I think, did you get, th it didn't work in the back? Okay. W do you know what your solution was? You have to show that. There's no way to go. Yes, it's So it's it's in here. Uh, I was in the CentOS phase. The vegan box. Okay. In the. So if you go into uh, the boxes, yeah. Oops. You should have went with Ubuntu then. Just kidding. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Mine's Libvirt, so it's probably in there. This vagrant file here. Okay. To VirtualBox. Okay. So, so when Vagrant pulls down that sent image. We have a vagrant file that I've written that you're using to do this, but there's also a vagrant file that describes the image, the box that's been downloaded. And so if you find where that box file is being stored on your machine, there's a vagrant file next to it, which is what I'm showing here. And so you just need to change this rsync here to VirtualBox. Is that right, VirtualBox? Uh, yes. Virtual box. And Probably. Because I'm, I'm using a libvirt provider, but for VirtualBox provider, you probably need to change that to VirtualBox. You're, you're going to need to find where your box file is. So let's see. So see how my box.image file, that's the CentOS box that it downloaded and that we've launched off of. Um, so this directory, this home directory that I'm in may be different for a Windows machine, but you need to find where that box image file is and where that vagrant file that came with it is and change rstink to VirtualBox. Sorry, I don't have better instructions on this. Okay, so let me keep moving. Let's see, we've created a user, we've got an image imported into OpenStack that we can launch off of. Next, we're going to create a network. And so once we have an image and a network, then we can actually launch a VM. So Neutron is the network management service, and it's, it creates virtual networks. So we think of a network as a switch with a bunch of wires plugged into it, and that creates the network. You can do that virtually on servers and even have them span servers, uh, and, and this is what Neutron does. It uses something called Open vSwitch on the system and it ties all the Open vSwitch services or services on the different machines together and then creates virtual networks. So the same way that we think about a bunch of wires plugged into a switch physically, Open vSwitch can do that virtually with virtual machines and it can even segment them so that they're separate from one another. The idea being here that we'll create a network and it goes into the project, and that means that your project will have its own network that all the VMs can be attached to, 
and no other project can attach to, can attach to that network. Only your VMs can, unless you do extra configuration. Quick, quick question. How many of you guys here um, use, use VMware? Okay. So, so, okay. so the concept should be easy, right? So the open V switch is basically an open source uh, version, a similar version to the uh, vSphere, uh, the vSphere distributed switch in a, in a VMware environment, mm -hmm. right? The, the, your, your virtual machines have virtual NICs. They, uh, un, for the most part, they typically don't pl can't plug into a di directly into a physical switch. So you need some kind of a virtual switch that's really like a bridge that you can connect those virtual NICs to. So that's all we're really doing. So creating the network, hop back in here, select your network tab, and select the networks link. On the right, I've got up in the top corner over here, I've got a create networks, create network button. I'm going to call this my private network. And then you need to give it a subnet. So this is kind of your, your private networking subnet ranges. I'm just going to do a 10, 10, 10, 0, 24. Um, if you've used 19268 or 17216, those are, those are good ranges to use. And you're, you know, we could just as easily put a 192.168.1.0 1.0/24 in there. You don't need to fill out. Uh, let's see, I put that in the subnet name. It should go in network address. You don't have to put a subnet name. You can if you want to. You could name it private subnet. There's, there's a network and there's a subnet that goes with it. So those are two different objects. Um, usually what I do is I name my network <coughs> private and then don't name my subnet and just give it the, the address that I'm using. Uh, the gateway IP will be assigned automatically in a private network like this. And then it's important to have DHCP enabled and that's by default on your network. The reason is when the VM comes up, the first thing it needs to do is get an IP address. And so Neutron will statically assign an IP address to it, but the instance will get it over DHCP. OK. Uh, just, make sure, just make sure everyone's clear. So what's happening is a, every project slash tenant, um, so I'm, I'll probably gonna use the word tenant just because it makes more logical sense you're to you're old school. <laughs> yeah, but I really mean project. So each project or tenant has to have its own network. So think of, um, again, you're from the VM world. Um, it's kind of like how you, they used to do um, vCloud dire uh, director networking, right? So every tenant has its own kind of private network. And for those, uh, the VMs inside those networks, they can only talk to each other. To be able to talk to the outside world, there's got to be a, uh, a pro like a provider network that's, that's tied into an act you know, a gateway that actually talks to the outside world. So what we'll eventually do is um, basically connect a tenant network to one of those provider networks, and that will allow the VMs to actually talk outside its own little world. Um, and a subnet is just a range within a network, a private network, a range of IP addresses that a, a virtual machine can have. So does that make sense some way? Are you awake? <laughs> Nod your head. Need some jumping jack? Is it jumping jack? I need a slide that said, yeah. let's do jumping jack. If you guys have questions, because uh, something's, uh, cause, uh, there's a lot of information I know we're throwing at you. If you have questions, just kind of raise your hand um, so we can kind of make sure that we're all, on the, you know, we're kind of all we're on the same page. Or just buy my book later. Yeah. That's fine. Or you can do that too. <laughs> No, it goes into your project. So when I logged in as my user, I'm logged into my project. So all the virtual resources that I create, um, what, what the dashboard kind of hides for you is that when you log in, you don't just log in as your user, you log in as your user to a specific project. And so I may be a user that's in multiple projects, but when I'm authenticating, I'm authenticating to a specific project. So because I'm authenticating to that specific project, all the virtual resources that I create automatically go into that project. Yeah, there's, so there's, there's, some, there's some division of responsibility. So uh, as a cloud operator, right, you, you're going to set up the underlying infrastructure because all of this got to run on physical stuff, right? It may be a virtual network or virtual switches, but it's got to sit on, it's got, actually got to talk to a real physical networking. So you set that up. You set up the provider network, 
right, that allows all the tenants to actually talk to the outside world. But the, each tenant has the um, ability to create his own private network and configure that. Mm -hmm. um, and then basically say, hey, I just want to tie into this uh, external network so I can talk outside. So let's create an instance and put it on this private network mm -hmm. and then we'll do the provider network side to show kind of yeah. the external access. So jump away from Neutron for a minute to Nova. This is instance management. This is basically the, the hypervisor manager um, that it's, it's going to manage these virtual machines on demand across the hypervisors. Um, and OpenStack in general is, is intended to be built on standard hardware and be it's designed to scale horizontally. So we've put I've put this here that it's designed to scale horizontally and designed for standard hardware, but that's OpenStack across the board, not just Nova. The intent is for you to go and take a bank of commodity servers, stick OpenStack on it, and really the only prerequisite that you have to have on these servers is that you have virtualization capabilities, which pretty much all machines have now, and then enough resources, RAM and, and CPUs, to be able to divvy up into virtualization. So let's take that network and the image that we have created, uh, that we imported, and create an instance. So I'm going to go compute into my instances and launch instance, and we'll call it first instance, because that's really creative. And then your launch instance has all these tabs down the side. Um, so we need the ones that have the, the blue stars are things that we have to go in and it has requirements for us. So our source, we have to go in and select this Cirrus image and say this is the image we want to boot off of. Your flavor is a definition of how, many, how much resources are allocated to your virtual machine. So you see the, the preloaded ones, there's tiny and small and medium and large, and they have a certain number of vCPUs and RAM and, and disk that get allotted to them. Um, for this demo environment that we're basically doing nested virtualization, because we're about to launch a VM inside of our virtual box VM, or our, our Vagrant VM, um, just do tiny, because if you do anything bigger, it, it's not going to fit. Um, but how 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 sorry, how many of you have used uh, AWS? Okay, so this concept should be pretty familiar, right? We're basically mm -hmm. doing s very similar to the thing that you would do on an AWS environment. So then next is networks. I'm going to select the private network that we created. Um, and then there's a couple other tabs that aren't required right off the bat. We'll jump back into a couple of them uh, a little bit later here. So now I'm going to do launch, and my first instance comes up. It's connecting to the hypervisor, which this is kind of an all-in-one, so it connects back to itself and it launches, it builds, um, and it should come up active. So now you see this, this active status. That means that the virtual machine has gotten the disk image, it's created a port on the network, it's spawned the VM, it's come up, and OpenStack sees it as a happy virtual machine ready for us to start interacting with. Right. And the key is, um, again, keep in mind, this is um, Dan's logged in as a regular user, as a presumably a, a <laughs> consumer of the cloud. This is not something that requires an operator or an admin to be able to do, right? So the whole, again, the whole idea of OpenStack is uh, giving end users the power to create, spin up their own resources, uh, just the way you would be able to do on, on uh, Amazon Web Services. But do it uh, not only in a public cloud, but potentially in a private cloud context. So now we get back to that provider network idea that this instance has come up and it's on this private network, but on that little private network in your project, the only thing that that instance could talk to was if we spun up another instance, then you could talk to that instance and it would be literally a, a little switch with two computers connected to it and they could talk to each other. There's no internet access per se that's been provided to them. So this provider network ends up being a, a catch-all shared network that all tenants can end up connecting to and interacting with. Um, so we'll jump back into Neutron and look at creating a second network and a router to go with it, and the router connects your private network to your public network. So because this provider network is only available, or I'm sorry, because the, private ne the public network is available for all projects to use, we have to be an administra administrator to create 
uh, an external network. And I have that in quotes because that's kind of the flag that OpenStack gives these provider networks, that when someone talks about an external network, they're talking about one of these provider networks. And you'll see in a minute when we create it, there's a flag that says external, and that's kind of where it came from. Um, so I'm going to log out from my non-privileged user and log back in as the administrative user. I'm going to get my password back out of my Keystone RC file, and you can change that password if you don't want to have to copy and paste it every time. So now logging back in, we can tell we're the administrator again because we have this, this uh, admin panel here. And this is where we're going to be able to manage this provider network. Scroll down and find networks. And you'll see the private network that I created that says it's in my project is already listed there. So now we're going to create a public network that we can then create a router to attach the public and the private network to one another. So as the administrator, I'm going to create a network. And I'm going to say public. I like to put this in the services tenant because you're not supposed to attach a instance directly to the public network. You need to have a router to go between. And the services tenant or services project is a generic project that all the components get added to so that they're, you know, like I said, every, everything in OpenStack has to be inside of a project. And the components are no different. The public network is no different. So this services project is kind of a catch-all. Don't really use this, but it has to be in a project sort of <laughs> designation. And then down here at the bottom, you'll see external network. This is the designation that says this is a provider network. So it's important that we check that network. Now, the that wasn't supposed to happen. Hmm. Let's try. Oh, change your provider type to VXLAN, and just put one as a segmentation ID external network. I skipped a step. Read the uh, manual. VXLAN. Yes, VXLAN. So. By default, Neutron is configured to use VXLAN tunnels so that if you had multiple nodes, it would connect those with these tunnels, and then all of your tenant traffic would go across these tunnels. We only have one node here. It's an all-in-one, so that's not terribly important. But because the configuration by default is that it uses VXLAN, we have to specify that our public network is of type VXLAN. Yeah. So one of the powerful things about OpenStack is that there are so many options. <laughs> There's so many ways. I mean, that's you know, the fact that you can pick all these different uh, network types from these virtual network types to actual just regular straight up VLANs, mm -hmm. right, and flat network. Um, that's a very powerful thing. Uh, it's also one of the most painful things about OpenStack, is that you know, there's there's 300 different, there are probably 300,000 different combinations ways you can configure OpenStack, and about a couple of hundred of them actually work in production. <laughs> so that's, um, that's one of the challenges and one of the reasons why uh, there are people offering OpenStack as, as a distribution or service because they're basically kind of giving their, opinionated, uh, uh, their opinion on what is the right configuration that could actually work in the production environment. Um, but for the purpose of, of playing with it, um, it, it's good to try to play as many, different of these, as many of these different options as possible to see what you can actually do and what actually works. And everybody starts in the same place. So just because yeah. it feels like you're drinking from f three fire hoses worth of information when you first start trying to configure an OpenStack cloud, um, know that everybody started. I started there. Ken started yeah, there. Yeah. Everybody has to go through kind of the tough process of learning enough configuration options to get far enough ahead to be able to bring something up and use it. Um, and so hopefully this Vagrant file can help you at least get started with that and be able to interact with it so that you have a baseline to move from. Now notice as the administrator that I created the public network in the services tenant, but there's no subnets associated with it. The automatic subnet creation is a non-privileged user feature within the dashboard. Um, as an administrator, you have to create them separately from one another. So I'm going to select this public network and it gives me the option to go in and create subnets. So you see over on the right side now, I'm going to click this Create Subnet button. And here again, the subnet name, you can name it if you want. I generally just name the networks and not the subnets. You're welcome to do either. The network address that you'll want to use is uh, this network address. Let me get it typed in, and then uh, I'll switch back so that you can um, 
uh, that you can copy it off. And the way that the Vagrant file is designed, um, we have to, you have to use this one specific to the Vagrant file because that's the way I configured it. But know that provider networks are something that are generally provided by your network administrator. So a lot of times this information would be given to you from a network administrator and they would say use this specific CIDR because this is the block of IP addresses that I've given you for your OpenStack um, cloud to work. It does. Mm -hmm. um, okay, uh, let me finish this real quick and then I'll go back and, and give you a sec to look at that slide. On the subnet, we need to go into subnet details. Oh, I put it in the name again. Maybe I should just start giving the, the subnets names so I put <laughs> them in the right box. Okay, the, the important thing about creating an external network is that you should disable DHCP. So by default, your internal private networks are going to have DHCP so that when your instances come up, they get DHCP off of your network that you've created. But because a provider network is one that your network administrator has given you this information, you're using a, a network that's been provided to you from your, ne your network administrator. So you don't want to put DHCP on that network because there's probably a DHCP service already running and you don't want those to conflict. And the IPs that you've been given by your network administrator will be assigned statically. So be sure to uh, enable, uh, disable DHCP on it. And then oftentimes there's a, a subset of these IPs that need to be used uh, and that's called an allocation pool. Um, so here at the bottom, I, I also have an allocation pool. And all that says is the IPs that this provider network will allow you to use are in the range from this, you know, 4.227 to 4.238. So it's, it's saying even though you have a slash 28, only use a certain amount of the um, IP addresses. So I've got to type now. Okay, does anyone still need this up for a few minutes? Everybody good for now? Great. I have a link at the end, and actually the link that goes to the Vagrant file, if you just take Vagrant file off the back of it in my Fedora people drive there, uh, you can look for the Austin PDF, and there's a PDF out there that has all the slides on it right next to the, in the same place as the Vagrant file. Yeah, same exact slides that are here in that PDF. Is, was that your question? Well, oh, slide that, information. Yes, that slide is in there. Yeah, so everything that's going up here is, is in that PDF, so that slide will be in there with that information. It's hard to see with the light. Okay, so now I've created the provider network. Now we want to attach the private network that our instance is attached to out to that provider network so that the instance has external connectivity. So I'm going to log back out from the administrator account and back into my non-privileged account. And there's kind of a neat thing that they have this network topology link under networks will bring up kind of a, a visual representation of what the network looks like. So this guy right here is the provider network that we just created. And this little cloud here is the, the, pub, the private network. Did I say that right? The provider network is the little globe. Right. And the private network is the little cloud. And then the instance is the little... Um, Mac. It looks like a Mac, doesn't it? Uh, in your non-privileged user account, there's a network tab. So drop down the network, and there's network topology. So what we need to connect this provider network to the private network is a router. So if we go down here to routers, if I only have one router, I generally will name it the same thing as my project. Um, and then it gives you a external network option here. So I'm going to go ahead and attach the public network to this router. And then you'll see once it's created over on the right side, it says clear gateway. So 
Another name for this provider network being attached to your router is a gateway. So if I were to hit clear gateway, it would detach those two, um, and it would say set gateway, and I would be able to, to uh, select that public network again. So now if we look at the, the network topology again, we see that the, the globe, the provider network, is connected to a router, these arrows, uh, but we still don't have a connection back into the private network to create a route all the way out. So go back to your router and select the router, and the connection from the private interface, the private network into the router is called an interface. So if I select the interfaces tab on that router, say add interface, and select my private network from the list, and submit it. Now I have a connection from the private network to the router and the public network to the router, and we should be able to see that in our visualization here. So you can see there's a link from the instance to the private network, to the router, to the public network. And this public network is uh, kind of in quotes public, right? That if you get actual public IPs on this public network, then there's actual public access, like <coughs> real world internet access. But public is a little bit misrepresented there in that if you have a corporate network, you still need this public network that has IPs on your corporate network for you to get into your internal network. So internal means that it's isolated from everything and public is, or the, the provider network, the external network, is the external connection outside of the OpenStack cloud to whatever network it's connected to. So this could be, like I said, a corporate network that you're on. It could be uh, your home router, you know, if you're doing this at your house and you need to get in through your 192.168 home router addresses. It could be actually public IPs that are, that are, you know, legit IPs that you can get from anywhere in the world. So at this point, we configured that. Um, so th at this point, you should be able to SSH into that instance. I'm sorry, there's a step before that. <laughs> Are you an IP? Yeah, we need to assign a floating IP. So a floating IP is an IP from that provider network that's assigned to the instance so that you can then contact it. So right now, my Cirrus instance has a 10.10.10.3 a address. And if I come over here and say associate floating IP, then I can add one to that instance. Now, a floating IP is a resource just like everything else. So I can't just say, give me a floating IP to my instance. I have to first allocate a floating IP into my project and then take the floating IP that's been allocated to the project and associate it to the instance. So here it says manage floating IP associations with this instance, but it says no floating IP address is allocated. So the dashboard's great about this. It gives you a little plus button. It says, let's allocate a floating IP. It'll come from the public network, associate IP. Now there's an IP that is listed in my IP address list there, and I can say, actually associate that with first instance, the name of the instance that we've launched. Over on the right side of the screen, there's a button next to create snapshot. And this disassociate floating IP was associate floating IP. So each of the each each of your instances that come up will have a drop down that have options of, of different so resources that it can. So connect. these are the IP addresses. Remember back when you were creating the provider network, you you put in the CIDR, and there was a, a IP address range. All we're doing here is saying, hey, I I know you have this range of IP addresses that was created that was signed. Give me one of those so that I can give it to one of my instances. So then your instance typically will have two virtual NECs, right? One NEC will have that private network IP address, so it can only talk internally. And then the other NEC, you're going to assign uh, this floating. That's what you're going to connect to the external or provider network. That one gets the floating IP address and is what theoretic, uh, should be able to allow you to talk to the outside, talk outside your tenant into to either to other tenants or even uh, to the external world. So, so someone had a question? Yeah, I just, uh, I don't know, I think it would be just like, if I found out there was another one trying to get back, or there was a TDF, would you just shortcut to that? The link that you got the Vagrant file from, 
It's in that same directory. So if you do radius fedora people org and just get the directory listing of that, there's a PDF in that directory there, right next to the vagrant file. Cool. Okay, so now that we have that floating IP associated with the instance, uh, I'm on my laptop and the networking, Vagrant has set up the networking for us to get from my laptop into this virtual machine. So you can see at the top, the 4.228 that was associated with the instance, I'm able to ping it. And then at the bottom here, I was able to SSH into my Ceros image. Um, by default, Ceros wants you to log in as user Ceros. Um, one of the security things they tried to get right. And then you'll notice down at the bottom though that when I log in, it's asking for a password. In general, when you download a VM or a, a cloud image from the, I the internet, uh, they're not gonna give you a username and password to get into it. So you have to set up a key pair, an SSH key pair. Um, so in the compute tab under access and security, you can manage your SSH key pairs and you can create a key pair, similar to the way you do in AWS, where it'll create one and it'll force you to use a private key that you download. Um, OpenStack also allows you to import a key pair, so I'm actually just going to um, import my public key that's on this laptop. So that router was what created by Intel? It was, it's a virtual router which is handled by network namespaces at the Linux level. Okay. Um, so there's a, a, there's a DHCP network namespace and there's a router, a Q router D, uh, namespace. And so if you, if you search for those, if you want to know more about them, there, that's some of the underlying plumbing of network namespaces and OVS that's being done under the covers. Okay, so I've, I've imported this key pair now. Um, I'm not sure that I'm able to run two instances on this demo environment at once. So what I'm going to do is terminate my first one. So I'm going to go into that same drop down and confirm delete instance. Because when this one booted, it didn't add, the, the key pair wasn't associated. That was one of the options in launch instance. So I'm going to go back into my instance launch and I'll do second instance. Again, because I'm really creative. And apparently not very funny either. Hmm. Uh, there was a so, a couple of things while he's doing this. Um, this part, how many of you feel like this is an overly complicated? It seems, th oh, things seem very overly complicated. Just set things up. No? No one? That's good. For a user, yeah. So, a couple of things to keep in mind. One is um, Dan's doing a lot of kind of the pre prep work, right, to get things up, up and running. So, in a steady state operational environment, you shouldn't have to keep doing this over and over. Mm -hmm. That's the one thing. Uh, second thing is, uh, in my experience, is if, you're de if your users are developers, particularly, almost none of them will ever use this dashboard. We're using this dashboard because it's an easy way to visualize how to do things in a workshop, but in reality, your developers will most likely um, be using command line, uh, and, how, and if they, I hate to hesitate to say we're doing it right, they're gonna be using the APIs and using different tools to actually uh, provision these resources. Mm -hmm. So you're not, they're not gonna be clicking through a bunch of tabs and wizards. Everything should be laid out in a config, you know, some kind of a manifest or a config file or something in the way they code their applications. And then the third thing is, if you haven't picked this up already, especially if, if it seems like a lot of you folks are uh, having a VMware background, which I also have, is you need to learn Linux. <laughs> There's no way around it. It's, especially on the networking piece. If you don't understand namespaces, uh, you can have, you know, those things like, and IP tables, uh, you, uh, you're gonna struggle. That's the only way I can put it. So, you don't, I'm not saying you have to be a Linux guru, but you have to know enough about Linux concepts, particularly in the networking space, to be able to, to for a lot of this stuff to, to make sense for you as you're operating it. Okay, so here launching this instance, I selected all the same source flavor networks and everything. The difference is I went to this key pair tab, and I'm gonna select my key pair that I just imported, and then launch the instance. And all that's gonna do is when the instance launches, it connects into a metadata service and pulls that key pair out and drops it in as the user. So once this guy comes up, I'd be able to log in without having to um, put in that password. I'd just be able to SSH directly to it. Um, 
We're running out of time here, so I'm going to go ahead and move and not actually display that. Um, we've got two things left real quick to talk about. Cinder block storage. Again, I talked about it earlier. If, you, if your instance gets axed for some reason, you want to have a place that you can save, in, um, save off data so that if it does get axed, you can reattach it to another VM and access that data. Uh, so Cinder does this for us. There's a volumes link that I just clicked here. Over on the right again, we can create volume, give it a name like first of all. Um, the source and the type aren't necessary. They're kind of extra parameters. The size is what you want to pay attention to. So I'm just going to create a one gig volume. Um, but if you had a, a larger backing, then you could do 10 or 20 or 100 gig, uh, whatever you're, you're able to provide. And then once that volume is created, you simply attach it. Um, so manage attachments over here on the right. And it'll give you a list of your instances. So I'm going to select my instance that I have running and say attach volume. And so now if you logged into that VM, the initial drive was dev SDA or VDA, I think, for, for virtual disk A. And then when this guy gets attached, uh, which it says it's attached now, another one will pop up inside of there and it will say VDB. So you now have a, a second block device that you can now create a file system and a partition table and mount into the Linux file system uh, just as you would had you plugged like a physical drive into a desktop or a server of, of some sort. Yeah, so because we're going to do this, you might want to skip Swift just because of the time. Okay. Because we can ask, they can ask questions. So because um, so we're going to do this, just keep, it, keep in mind w uh, by default when you create a VM, um, the, the root disk, it's an ephemeral disk. That means when you, dis when you delete the instance, all the data gets purged, right? And you can imagine in some cases, that's not what you want. That's where the Cinder block storage project comes in. That's a way for you to take a, a volume, attach it, like as Dan said, almost like a USB drive. And then what, in that in case, when you terminate the instance, the data, the, that volume uh, persists over past that time and still has all the data on it. And, you can re and then you can attach it to something else. One thing I, I need to caution you about is, although um, a lot of customers use um, their kind of SAN, you know, a SAN, like their traditional EMC or NetApp array, to, cr uh, to provide the Cinder, the back end for the Cinder volume, Cinder is not a shared storage technology. Right? This is not like VMware where you can take an, you know, a, a, vol a volume from EMC and say, okay, now I got two VMs that can, that can both connect in a cluster and then one one uh, hypervisor fails, I can restart it. Th that, that's not the way it works. When, if that hypervisor that you attach the cinder volume to uh, dies, it, you have to manually or script uh, detaching that volume and reattaching it to something else. Okay, that's really important because I, I always get, people get confused because they, in their head, they, they think it's like a, a VMware type thing. But there's, there's no cluster. There volumes. is the project Manila, which does yeah, shared file different. systems. So, right. you know, the, the cinders like a SAN, and Manila is shared file systems right. like NFS or something like that. Yeah. I just labeled myself as a uh, Linux guy, NFS. Yeah, so <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the final thing, for, so we're, we're going to, just for time's sake, we're going to skip Swift. Um, you can read about object storage if you search online. You know, using it in the dashboard is. is pretty simple, just like everything else. There's a create container, add object and container. There's, those are the two concepts. Is that there's a container that you add files to, and then you add objects, which are just simple files. There's no metadata about these files. There's just a name and the content that goes with it. Um, I wanted to touch real quick from a, a Red Hat perspective. Um, I mentioned earlier that we have kind of the community and the, the supported product separation. Within the RDO community, we have two installation methodologies. One is called Packstack, which is what we use today. And it's generally intended for demonstration, proof of concept, small deployments where you're kind of playing and learning OpenStack. The other one that we have out there is called Triple O. And there's a quick start out there that you can read through and work on that as well if you'd like to get involved or to try and use Triple O. Um, Triple O's basis is that 
triple O O O O stands for OpenStack on OpenStack, and the the idea is that it uses um, OpenStack to deploy OpenStack. And so what it actually does is stands up an all-in-one OpenStack, just like the one we're using today here, but it adds in bare metal support, which is the project ironic. And so the bare metal support can then go out and provision a larger cluster of machines. And triple O is where you're going to get all of your, your bigger um, capabilities like high availability or um, like provisioning larger software-defined storage clusters and things like that. Um, and then from the, the enterprise side, the supported side, OSP Director is our supported product. And so the thing to note here is that Triple O and OSP Director are one-to-one one -one with each other. Triple O is our community-supported um, installer, and OSP Director is our, our productized supported product. Uh, so if you pick up Triple O and you like what's in Triple O or need help with Triple O in some rate, in some aspect, OSP Director is what we're going to be, is what we sell as a product. And so uh, it's important to know that Packstack is kind of just for play, and Triple O is, is intended for a larger, um, longer term supported type installation. Um, this is just a review of the first slide we have with all the different components that we've worked through. Um, and then here's a resources page with. Uh, you know, visit Rackspace. Rackspace and Red Hat are, are partnering now to um, provide cloud solutions. Um, RDO project is where you can get the RDO bits and the community support of what we've worked on here today. OpenStack, of course. TriStack is a, a, a free platform that you can go and spawn instances as a non-privileged user, so interacting with uh, the networking and the images and the block storage and the object storage. If you don't want to have to install OpenStack, but you want to use a demonstration type environment, TriStack is a set of servers funded by the foundation and managed by Red Hat. Uh, so exactly what we just used here in this demonstration is what's running on a bank of servers at TriStack.org. Um, and then my Fedora people link at the bottom is where the Vagrant file and the PDF are. So you're welcome to pull those down. Um, and you know, email if you're having trouble with those. Um, I think that's it for us. If you yeah. have questions, you're welcome to stick around and ask them. I do we have time for a couple? Not really. Right, it, yeah, if you have questions, come on up and see us, and uh, we'll stick around for a little bit. Thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for hanging with us for a nice long session. <laughs>